Hello. So I'm talking today with Rival Voices, No Silver V, uh, who I've been following today on on Twitter for quite a while, and we've had conversations here and there. And um, Rival was willing to talk to me on my podcast, but didn't want to schedule anything. So today was the morning that we were both free and in the mood to talk. So thanks for making time and space to talk with me, Rival. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so um, maybe I could give a little bit of context for why I'm interested in talking and then we can see where it goes. Um, you know, I've, I think I've been following you for maybe like a year and a half. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say I haven't engaged too much with any one particular tweet, but the general vibe has been very inspiring to me. And in particular, um, uh, you sort of indicated in your tweets and also your messages to me that for you posting on Twitter, ship posting, as we like to call it, is is essentially a spiritual practice for you. Would, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, sort of. I have complicated feelings. I usually have complicated feelings. Um, so yes. basically, that's the way that other people have described it to me. Um, there's this, you know, interesting thing that had been going for a while which was that i had a bunch of thoughts and i used to just write them in you know private notebooks um and at some point i had a blog and that blog got mentioned on twitter and i was like you know who the fuck are these weird people talking about my blog right um and i wanted to know what else they were saying so i started an account and i had this idea of instead of posting my thoughts um you know or, or writing them down in a notebook posting them on twitter and that seemed to be different psychologically because there was a difference in writing for something that I knew was you know default private and writing for something that I felt could be public in principle um, even if in, you know in the beginning I had no followers um, and I was very you know I was a little bit posting my deepest darkest thoughts and um, you know expecting to uh, be smitten uh, by the public or the heavens or something like that. But in fact, you know, people were kind of into them, people related. And then at some point people were like, oh, you know, this really, you know, it seems like you're transforming. This seems really spiritual and all of that. And I was like, oh yeah, maybe I guess that's what's going on. Um, so, it, so it's more like, it's, it's much less like I deliberately tried to do something. It's much more like I found myself in the middle of something and then other people were like, oh, do you think this could be that? And I'm like, yeah maybe you're onto something right right uh what what kinds of uh shifts would you say you well what, what kinds of how how did you approach the tweeting like what kinds of experiments have you run and what kinds of shifts have you noticed from from these experiments with tweeting yeah so basically um the main thing that there was a period i think it was uh last year where I basically was actually, you know, trying to post every single um, thought that I had that was explicit and, you know, above some like minimum bar of interestingness, right? So if it was like, oh, you know, I need to get groceries, I wouldn't post that. Um, but if it was like a fully formed thought that felt interesting, I would post it. Um, at some point, I think, I think for, for that year, I was tweeting on average 50 times a day, um, which, you know, I, I think is fairly high um, and I have a lot of practice with you know what you could call more traditional um, you know psychological uh, processes like focusing and all of that so I know what it feels like you know to have a felt shift in your beliefs um, I know what it feels like to process content I know what it feels like to have an insight I know what it feels like to have an update like I know the phenomenology of all of that um, and I could track that those things were happening and I could track um, major behavioral changes. So for example, um, you know, recently a month back or so, something happened in my personal life that I think if it had happened, you know, one, two years ago would have taken me out for like six months. Um, this time it was like one tough week, um, one episode of um, uncontrolled sobbing in the shower. Uh, with various body contortions and then like so far it seems that I'm over it um, which like you know from 
in terms of like how much suffering those six months would have been in the past if this had happened, you know, two years ago or whatever, versus how much suffering it was now. Um, it was, it was, yeah, quite good. That's amazing. Um, huh. If, if, if other people would describe it as a spiritual practice, but that's not necessarily the language that you, you, you would use, how would you talk about it exactly? Yeah. So my qualms with the spiritual side are that um, in my mind, um, it relates to stuff like, I don't know, um, so I don't relate it to stuff like Buddhism, for example, because for me, Buddhism just seems like kind of a like scientific endeavor. It's just like, you know, if you do these practices, you'll be able to observe these things. You do the practices, you observe the things, you have the updates. It's like, you can just like verify the thing through and through. Um, and then when people talk about spirituality, um, I tag it in my mind with more something like, um, you know, Christianity or like a religion like that, that like posits. And I, and I know that, you know, there's Buddhisms that posit gods, but, you know, just stay with me for here for a while. Um, and, and that one of the big shifts that I went through as I was growing up was to stop being a believer because I was born in a very, very Catholic family in Portugal. Um, and so whenever people talk about that, it triggers some sort of like um, mimetic immune response. Um, even though, <laughs> even though um, I have also recently started having experiences that, um, you know, that I think people would reasonably say fall under that realm, right? So like I go to a church and I cry because of the fucking statues and because I feel so blissed out um, and so humbled by it. Um, I, you know, I'm just in my living room and I feel intense waves of bliss um, and, you know, the words like the kingdom of God come, come into my mind and like there's this whole like body vibration, really high energy, really high frequency, really pleasurable feeling. Um, and I'm just like, ver just very generally confused about like, what the hell is going on there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's mm -hmm. not to answer your question and then to answer your question about what would I call it, I would just call it psychological practice maybe and sorry i i want to go back on that um practice has a sense of uh deliberateness that this didn't have this much more like felt like there's all of this content inside of me it needs to get out or i'm gonna fucking explode and like this was just a vehicle for me to not explode um so it isn't like oh i had to make myself do this it's more like if i hadn't done this, I think I would be in much worse shape. I see. So sort of like psychological self-care through posting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, although that sounds, you know, lamer, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's a fair description. Okay. Okay. So there's a few things that you said there that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, let me start with, it seems like uh, one of the really important foundations for this to be possible for you was your existing familiarity with psychological methods like focusing. Did yeah. I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, about like your your history with focusing and other methods and, and how you came to have that as a foundation? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so basically the story is um, in 2013, um, I was doing an Erasmus, which is like, um, you know, European study exchange thing for a semester in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And and, you know, my pet conspiracy is that um, Erasmus is a program that the European Union promotes so that European people will have sex and babies with one another and won't go to war again in the future. And this is because kind of like everyone knows that the thing you do in Erasmus is you get super drunk, go out clubbing and professors are super easy on you. Like, you know, you go to one class and you get like an A or whatever, like the top grade that you can get. Um, so, so it's really easy and there's a lot of free time. Um, wow. And so... Yeah, it, it's great. I love it. <laughs> Highly recommend it. Um, and so I had a lot of free time. And during that free time, um, kind of three things happened sort of at once. One is um, I, I was on less wrong and they used to cite the litany of Gendlin, uh, which was something like, you know, whatever is true is already so. Acknowledging it doesn't make it worse and not acknowledging it doesn't make it go away. Right, which is like a fun thing, whatever. 
but like then I kind of explored the guy and I found this book focusing which sounded really interesting I, and I got into it and I started reading it so that was one another one was there was a guy called um, Nick Winter who had a book on you know various things that he was doing with his life various uh, you know stuff that he was trying extra whatever one of the things was lucid dreaming um, so I started looking into that at the same time and third, there was, so I was coming from a less wrong, very like, um, you know, scientific materialist worldview. And there was this um, social psychologist in my master's, I was studying cognitive sciences, um, who was talking about social reality. And, you know, he had this like elaborate theories on all of that. And I was like, you know, fuck this guy, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. And also, and also he offered the practice because in Ljubljana, you don't need to have any accreditation to work as you know basically a therapist or a psychologist or or, or like a psychologist that gives therapy a psychotherapist and so i met with him so there was lucid dreaming um focusing um oh also meditation this was like the first time that i was starting meditating so like i was just exploring all kinds of practices and there was this guy and then this guy he was really interesting because he had no therapeutic intention like he's he didn't want me to call him a therapist his explicit intention was we sit down we talk for an hour and we are roaming your mind that's all that's happening and that ended up being like the perfect training ground for me to learn focusing and you know and i think this is often the case i just happened to have a life where um i hadn't had the opportunity um for a very long time to talk to people about you know what was going on inside me and how i was feeling and all of that just like in general that's not something i talked about or that there was openness from other people to hear me speak about um, and what this meant is that over the years stuff just like grew and grew and grew and grew and it wasn't subtle anymore like you know usually when people talk about focusing it's like oh you know you have to you know find the felt sense and it's really subtle and like you have to clear space and there's and you have to pay attention and for me it wasn't like that at all it was just like shit tons of content a person who's willing to hear me speak about it and it's just like completely you know it was just like bursting forward um and so reading the book and being with that person like once a week you know you know i did the whole thing i found the child self i had updates, I cried, I realized what a felt shift felt like. I learned, I learned to speak from the felt sense, which I think is the main thing that I do. Um, I don't speak from my head, I don't speak from scripts, I don't speak from things that I've said before. Like I just find the felt sense and I speak from there. Another name for it would be unsymbolized thinking, um, if people want to look it up. Um, so yeah, so that so that's like that was like my training grounds, I guess you can say. Um, then lots of shit happened in my life. And then when I found myself on Twitter, I guess everyone that I'm writing to is serving as that uh, Slovenian guy again. Um, or like my imagination of him is, is my audience sort of. Um, and in this case, it's great because, you know, instead of being one guy, it's like whatever, 6,000 people. And then they give me input, they give me feedback. And I don't know, it's just like, I really like the flywheel that I have going on. Definitely, definitely. Um, if someone, I, I really resonate with so much of what you say, and it's mm -hmm. certainly been consonant with my own experience. And and um, you know, just knowing that you're doing what you're doing kind of has made a lot of experimentation for me possible. Like without even necessarily engaging in the same content or themes or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I'm curious. I, I imagine some people watching this or listening to this might not have had that prior experience with focusing or may not even have heard of it before. And yeah. uh, what would you say to such a person about like how to start engaging in these kinds of experiments and practices if they don't have that prior experience? Oh, oh man, okay. Should, should, I, should, should I do a brief run over what focusing actually is? That'd be great. Because that's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Wonderful, please so, do. So basically, check this shit out. Um, so basically what happened is um, in the University of Chicago a few years back, I'm going to say 1970s, although I don't really know when it was, you had this guy, um, Eugene Gentling, who was a philosopher um, who came from, was born in Vienna, moved to the US. And when he was learning English, um, you know, so he was born in Vienna, so his, his uh, mother tongue was German. When he was learning English, he would do a thing that I think people often do, which is he would find the word 
that he meant in German, and then he would try to translate it in his head to English. So if you were looking at the chair, he would come up with whatever is, is the name for chair in, uh, in German, and then he would try to come up with the English word chair. And a teacher of his observed that and said, you don't need to do that. You can just go from the feeling of like chair, like the feeling of the thing that you're like thinking of or trying to point to or trying to talk about, and then directly go from that to English. And this was when he was very young and it, it just kind of like stayed with him. Um, you know, tens of years go through, he's now in university and he's working with Carl Rogers, who's like, you know, one of the foremost uh, humanistic psychologists. And they're trying to figure out what it is that determines positive outcomes out of uh, psychotherapeutic interventions. It's so like, you know, there's, there's tons of therapies and their sense of ways of doing it, like what works, what doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. So they film a bunch of hours of therapy and then they analyze it um, and trying to discover what the factors are, right? And they come to the conclusion that uh, it's such a, it, it's so amazing that they could notice this, but they come to the conclusion that basically what determines positive results out of psychological interventions is whether people stumble when they're speaking, basically. So if someone, if you ask a question in a therapeutic setting and someone just like immediately says a bunch of stuff, like that probably means they won't have great results. If someone is like, well, it's, it's not exactly that. It's more like, mm -hmm. wait, sorry, give me a second. And then they say something and then they're like, no, that's not exactly true. And then they say it again. And then like, there's this process where they're checking the thing that they just said against their felt sense of the thing that's true or that they're trying to say, which basically is what the teacher was uh, 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 pointing gently to, but then he named it the felt sense when he was young, which is when you stare at the chair, you just have a sense for it. Like you just, you just feel it somehow. So same thing when you're in a party and you see someone that you know that you know, but you can't remember their name. If I give you the wrong name, you will know that it's wrong. You will know it somehow doesn't fit this feeling. And you keep iterating through names until there's a name that's like, bam, it just feels like it perfectly matches the feeling that you have. And so this like pre-verbal feeling, this unsymbolized feeling he called the felt sense. And then you have, you know, whatever words you try to describe it. Or for example, when I say, can you say that in different words, what you're going back is your feeling, your bodily understanding of the thing. And you can put words to that and you can put, you know, many, many words to that. And he basically, discovered that that's the thing. So going and trying to speak from your bodily sense of a situation is the thing that determines whether or not you're going to have good uh, outcomes in therapeutical sessions. And he developed a process that facilitates people speaking from that place instead of from you know their words or their mind or their brain or their head sort of, which is where people usually talk from, um, kind of like, you know, can things that they have heard before or like repeating themselves from earlier and not like checking in the moment with their body. And that process, and it's a six stage process, uh, he called focusing. Um, you know, and he has a book. Uh, if people want to get into it, I really, really, really recommend the book. It's called Focusing. He also has a website, uh, it's focusing.org. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a page there, a PDF that lists the six steps. And they also have focusing partnerships that I think are free. So you, you just have a person who's there to teach you how to do it and then listen to you doing it, which is amazing. Um, yeah, and I definitely think it's a superpower, for sure. Oh, that's fantastic. And I, I'm super curious about, you know, this stumbling phenomena that they found, like, how mm -hmm. does that experience translate for you to <clears throat> posting on Twitter? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I don't want to be um, arrogant, I guess. But. Well, but part of the reason I ask is in my own phenomenology of it at this point, I, I um, uh, it, my experience of it is there's something in my body that wants to be said, and then I open up Twitter on my phone or the web app and I type it and there, it doesn't yeah. feel like they're stumbling anymore. It's just like, it's like signal yeah. post. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So you, you are the one that, that was arrogant first. So now it's fine. Yes. <laughs> no, so yeah, so so my experience is this as well now. So basically, I think that um, the process is at a level such that it basically runs in the background. And then I get this like 
fully formed sentences with a period at the end that I find insightful. And I'm like, that's a tweet. Um, and you know, they're coming from somewhere and there was an intention that generated them, but I don't, unless I'm working on something that's like very large, like trying to refactor a huge chunk of my worldview, like th th this like, you know, <laughs> things that will fit in 140 characters are the kind of stuff that I can just like generate in or like process in the background all the time. And then when they come to me, they're basically explicit and I just put them up. Um, so I think the process of like stumbling a bunch is when you're very much in the beginning and when you get used to just like speaking from there all the time. Although, although, although a little bit to contradict myself, um, if you see videos of Jordan Peterson speaking uh, when he's giving his lectures, he is a trillion percent doing this. Like he pauses very frequently and for very long and he shakes his hands in a particular uh, motion and he rewords the thing he just said and he corrects himself as he's speaking. Now he's talking for like two hours, so that makes sense to me. Um, and I do think that he's probably a very advanced user because he talks about the importance of speaking the truth as you perceive it. And I believe that he has been doing it, you know, for at least 10 years, probably way more like 20 to 30. Um, so it might be that you still stumble, but for the kind of, you know, um, here's me stumbling, for the kind of small content that we're posting, yeah, it just comes fully formed and then I just send it out. But I think because of all of the prior work. Yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like the shortness makes it possible for there to just be like direct pipeline and then <clears throat> also the difficulty of the subject matter that if it's extremely complex or causing you to really investigate certain things you haven't looked at before, then it might be harder. But if it's small and sweet and it's, you've just digested it, it can come out straight. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's right. Although I also think that, um, so I've had essays. So I think my essay on conspiracy theorism came basically fully formed. Like I just knew precisely the feeling of it and what needed to be said. And that took like, I don't know, that, that, that was like two or three weeks maybe. But, the, mm -hmm. but, but I've also for a lot, like I'm not <laughs> at all the kind of person who wants to like, you know, review a thing and edit it and blah, blah, blah. And like work on it over and over. Like I'm not that person. I just want things to come like fully formed. And so I allow lots of time for background processing so that when they come to me, like I just ship them out and they're done. Um, so, so there's also have, there has also been an intention for things to come out at the very, very um, high level of uh, editing already. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting because that was the topic of our conversation that sort of preceded this that we we're messaging about is like, uh, I was talking about my preference to uh, ensure the, the clarity and generality and like rhetorical strength of the things that I write. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to revise what I said earlier about the phenomenology of it, it's like often I'll have a feeling, I'll write it, and then I take a moment, I pause to like reflect on it rhetorically and say, am mm -hmm. I conveying this in the best possible way given I, what I know about writing and editing and how Twitter works and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. but the like content is there. I might just alter words or structure or things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and it sounds like, and, and you were saying, you said, well, you're really optimizing for speed. So tell, yeah. tell me about that. Why is speed important to you? Yeah, so basically the thing I don't want is to get stuck in a particular, so, hmm. so the point for me is not any particular thought. It's somehow to get to the next thought because I think each thought is just a byproduct of whatever processing is going on. So the thoughts matter a little bit because you know other people find them valuable because they're like you know explicit artifacts that you can point to again in the future uh, because people can relate to them and can discover you because of them. And that's like all fine. But as far as I'm personally concerned, I have a process. The process happens to produce this thoughts as a byproduct. And the faster I'm going through that process or the faster I'm going through the thoughts is an indicator that I'm going through the process faster. And the process mm -hmm. is what I really care about. Um, and so I just, I just wanna get to the next one. I just wanna like keep churning it. Um, and then because of that, there's very, very little editing. I basically only edit to fit the character limit or and this is the thing I do very, very often. I have thoughts that are about myself 
and then I rewrite them in a general way because I think that then people can relate to them. Um, mm. and, and that's basically it. Mm. Because mm. like, I just, so for me, the thoughts are completely secondary or like the tweets are secondary. What matters is the process. Tweets and thoughts are just a proxy for the process. And I just want to get to the, the process fast. Mm. I, I've, I've, I've definitely already asked you this question, but I'm sensing that the way that you're talking about it now has, has a little bit of a different flavor to it. So let me try again. What, what would you say the process is right now in this moment? It's like, okay, here's what it's like. I might or might not have gotten this metaphor from uh, Mike Lipman at meditation stuff. Do you know those, those balloon dogs? Like how you how you can like take those long balloons and like craft them into shapes. Oh, yeah. and stuff or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just imagine that you have one of those long balloons and it's like it's super twisted upon itself. Like it's super like someone, you know, some sort of like balloon master, super twisted. It. And then so the thing I'm going through is basically I'm twisting that and I'm the balloon. Um, and to not be metaphorical, uh, what I think happened is, you know, there's a there's a fantasy maybe that you go through the world, something happens, immediately your system adjusts to the thing that happens and you keep like doing whatever is the thing that you're doing, right? There's you know, maybe a more common thing that happens, which is something happens, it's bad, your system can't process it because you're too young or you're too powerless or whatever, or it was just overwhelming in the moment, like somehow the thing didn't get uh, digested and it just stays there. And I think over time, the default route is for people to accumulate more and more of those. And so there's very, very little almost like leftover energy for living, which is, I think, why most old, old people feel like quite dead. Um, and I don't mean old like 80. I just mean, you know, <laughs> once people are like fucking 30, um, it feels like all of their childhood energy is gone. Um, and I think that the difference is the, ch the child doesn't didn't have the time to get as much of this and process pieces um, as the adult. Um, and so basically what I think I'm going through is like reprocessing all of these things that happened in the past, refactoring my worldview um, to deal with them um, and freeing up that energy for living uh, that I want. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, I, I don't wanna say identified, uh, but I really, value and I'm very connected to my child self in a way that uh, adults around me seem not to be like they seem to have forgotten what it was like to be a child and I like 100% haven't um, and I really really value how it was to be a child um, and to have that like you know energy and openness and curiosity um, and so like I put in a lot of effort um, to kind of like maintain and drive myself more and more towards that state I guess would be my articulation Hmm. Fascinating. Uh, okay, I want to pick up a thread from earlier. Mm -hmm. You were talking about um, doing this process has resulted in shifts for you, and yeah. uh, and and that those those are sort of in the ballpark of things that would be described traditionally of religious spiritual experiences or shifts <laughs> or things like that. Um, yes. Certainly, I, 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 alluding to awakening, perhaps yes. Uh, yeah, maybe, yes. Maybe, yes. maybe, question mark. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so I just want to throw that in the field. And I know for me, um, and, and just surfacing this in case this is useful, uh, awakening is just a huge question mark for me. And when people talk about, oh, you know, I've awakened or I've had this experience, uh, my, my uh, warning flags go up. I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean by that? And what does that mean? And um, I actually had this wonderful post a while ago where I said, someone signals that they're awakened, you ellipsis. And then just people replied in a whole bunch of ways. And there was actually a whole host of really fascinating replies that were just far more mm -hmm. complex than I thought. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people were like, oh, just ignore them. And some people were like, you know, oh, they're probably awakened. And then there's everything in between. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's talk about that. Like what kinds of shifts have happened for you or transformations and what are those phenomenologically like for you and your experience yeah um god that's a good question um so i was actually thinking more uh you know practical life stuff about my relationship of so 
not so much my phenomenology and, and my experience and my experiencing and you know my sensors and all of that um and more like how i relate to others and how i relate to the world um mm -hmm. i do think there has been a marked decrease in suffering um i think that's definitely a thing um i do think that i have um you know and this is this is like you know fuck it whatever like this is kind of like normie achievements but still i think i think it's important and it marks something which is i've developed in ways that were very 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 difficult for people to predict um, a priori so for example when i was a child i was relatively small uh, and weak and frail um you know eventually i was national uh, uh weightlifting junior champion so that was great uh, when i was in high school i had terrible grades when I ended my master's, I basically ended um, not cum laude because I fucked up my master defense, my thesis defense, but basically, which was also very unpredictable. So like there's there's this, you know, kind of like normie achievements that I think I maxed out coming from a position of like where you would definitely would not have predicted that. So I think that's that. Um, I think there's something like um, my relationship to other people where there definitely have been periods in my life where people basically just feel slash think that I'm a magician because of the things that socially I can pull off. Um, so I so I was trying to speak about very, um, you know, practical, you know, potentially measurable um, um, results, sort of. Then there's the second side, which is the side that you were kind of going into with the awakening question, all of that. And to be honest, I'm fairly confused about all of that, in part because mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of like, um, you know, <laughs> aggressively choosing to not have any teacher or anything like that and trying to figure out everything on my own um and because of that <laughs> i'm i'm you know i'm not in a tradition such that i can compare notes and then having said all of that um i started meditating in 2013 when i was in ljubljana i only basically ever did concentration um i am very undisciplined uh I do like, you know, four months every single day and then I won't do it for like eight months, whatever. And I'll just like iterate that cycle. And I only ever did the retreat for three days. Um, and then in regards to achievements, the ones that really sent to mind are that, I think this was a year ago, almost now, um, in the summer, I remember swimming in the ocean and yeah, when there's a point where we get where, uh, words are difficult to transmit the experience unless the person has had the experience that you're referring to. But but it seems like a default part of your phenomenology is an understanding of the boundary of your body, or that's not even true, the boundary of you versus not you. So there's, you know, there's your experience, there's part of your experience that you tag as I, and there's part of your experience that you tag as not I. Um, and you can imagine both of those tags um, temporarily suspending, and there's just experiencing basically um so had that in the ocean had that walking home and was like basically tripping balls by myself for an hour um i had one where i was walking to the bathroom and i was having a thought but i mistakenly thought that i was perceiving and i realized that i was having a thought and that was huge i was like oh holy shit i can like be confused about the modality of my intentionality. Like I can, and, and like in a way that's obvious, right? Because you dream all the time and it's not the fact that when you dream, you know that you're dreaming. Like you you just believe it's real life. Um, but to be awake and to realize that just a second ago, I thought I was perceiving and actually I was just imagining was like sort of shocking. Um, and I think I've had like a few, um, you know, small insights of that kind. I had one, in that retreat where um, there was some mental object that I was extremely drawn to. And then somehow I popped out and I saw it as a mental object and it had no interest, like all the craving that I felt for it was gone. And immediately I forgot about that and it happened again and I was craving it. And then I popped out again and I was like, holy shit, how did I just go from craving this so hard to popping out and realizing that it's like just you know an indifferent mental object to forgetting about it and then craving it so hard again and that was like you know sort of like little 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 mind-blowing experience um but yeah i think i've had a, a few of these um insights i just don't know how to 
yeah, talk about them or position them in any sort of framework because I don't have it. Like I've basically only read um, Chula Das's The Mind Illuminated book. Um, and so like, you know, I can kind of go there and be like, oh yeah, I think I'm level like four or five because I can turn on metacognitive introspective uh, awareness. Uh, but, but yeah, but that's it. Why, why do you think that these shifts that you're discussing would be a byproduct or a result of the processes that we were talking about earlier of like focusing and posting on Twitter and things like this? Yeah, I'm, um, so I definitely associate the first kind to it. Um, so like, the, you know, the more like normie achievement kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm because you can just imagine a being that's like really adapted for its environment. Um, and then you throw it into another environment, right? And like, you know, everything is failing. It's just red flags and it's just like false positives and all of its sensors are not working because like it just wasn't built for this, right? And I think that as you do psychological processing, you become more like a being that's adapted to your environment because like, the history of information and of experiencing that um, you have taken in is actually being digested by the system and the system is actually updating on it. So it's not like you're in denial. You're like, no, this, you know, this actually isn't true. This actually doesn't happen. I was confused. It's like you're actively changing your worldview to maximally explain uh, the pattern of experiences that you've had. And that just like adapts you to your environment. So that's that. And then the second kind of experiences, because they seem more like maybe traditional meditation um, achievements, I would associate them to the meditation practice that I've had on and off for fucking nine years or whatever. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's how I would like um, splice those. Hmm. How would you relate the sort of psychological work to the more contemplative work? Yeah, man, I don't know. <laughs> I have, okay, so I went, okay, sorry. Um, there is a presupposition that if someone is doing something, they know what they're doing. And I wanna, <laughs> I wanna sure. put back on this. Like, I just find myself doing shit, right? And then like, I try to figure out what the fuck I'm doing, but it's more like I find myself in the middle of the ocean, right? Um, I, the only thing that I have here is external, which is, so I have two models. And um, one is from Qin Zen Yang, where he says that psychological work is more like, you know, there's this line of awareness um, in your mind um, and there's stuff that you're not aware of, there's stuff that you're aware of. And then psychology is you basically, you know, put your hands deep into the unaware parts and you bring something to the light and then it updates basically. Um, and then meditation would be instead you kind of like um, lower the water line of awareness so that more and more stuff comes into awareness and it's burned off. Um, so that's one model that I have. Um, and then the other one is from um, Chuladasa, where he says that you really, 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 really want to basically um, work through as many, you know, what he calls obscurations, um, clashes, I think is, is the Buddhist term, um, maybe some skaras. Hey, you know, you see, I'm, I'm not good at this. Um, but anyways, you want to work through them before you know, you reach no self because if not, you're going to be in for a bad time. And, you know, that seems bad. I don't want to be in for a bad time. And so I'm doing it. But it's, it, but it's much less like something I'm deliberately doing and more like something I'm drawn to do. Like, I don't know basically what I would be doing with my life if I weren't doing these things. <laughs> uh, I totally appreciate, you know, you're just figuring it out and you're trying it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm curious about how that connects to uh, the attitude that you're sharing of like not wanting to have a teacher or a tradition and figuring it out for yourself. Like what, what's valuable to you about uh, doing it yourself and figuring it out for yourself? Yeah, I just don't trust anyone. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's strictly true. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, again, I've just noticed um, by contrasting myself to other people that tens of other people, uh, you know, get uh, inducted in some tradition or have a teacher and I don't, and it's like, oh, interesting, why, why is that going on? And I've also noticed that I'm really, um, I tend to avoid reading primary sources and 
until until I've basically generated all of the insights around the primary source so that then I see it from like secondary uh, sources and tertiary and like other people speaking about whatever the text is or the, the thing that I care about. Um, and I think it might just be a little bit um, pushing back against what is the default, which is like, you know, at school, you learn to, you know, say whatever this person thought about whatever subject. And it's like, sure, you know, and if you want to be a historian of that subject, maybe that's useful. But if you want to generate your own thoughts, that's really not useful. Um, and I really care about generating my own content. Oh, okay. And here's, okay. So I, I actually said it as a joke, but I think there's a little bit of truth to the, like not trusting anyone part. Um, I think that unless you generate your own content, you don't know what's going to come in laced with the content that you're getting from the outside. And it's frequently the case that the same type of people that I and you probably um, would trust because they're extremely, extremely competent um, are competent enough to lace memes inside of the content that don't necessarily have our best interest in mind, but you know, whatever agenda that they have, I've been through that. I know what that's like. Um, and so I just know that I need to get like independently, very, very smart so that if there's external content coming, I can like break it down into the parts and be like, yes, yes, definitely not. Maybe. Huh. Can you give me an example of that kind of thing happening? Yeah, I can. Um, let me think because I don't want to say anything that boxes me basically. Um, a very simple general example um, is basically um, whatever political terms are being astroturfed at the moment. Um, they are designed to make it easy to um, have some thoughts and hard to have some other thoughts. So like, okay, here's the thing that won't work. You tell people have this thought, like just won't work. They will, they'll be like, fuck you. Like, why should I have that thought? No, you're bad. Here's the thing that definitely works. You call something, something else that makes it really easy for them to have that thought. For example, so, you know, I don't know if you want to go there, but I'm just going to go there. So recently, um, the lab leak theory started to get some sort of like, you know, it's getting mainstream traction. And John Stewart came on to whatever, you know, ver new version of the Daily Show there exists. And he was like, you know, it most definitely came from the uh, Wuhan lab because it's literally called Wuhan coronavirus. Now, if you have a little bit of philosophy, you know that there's something called the use mention distinction um, where you know there's the name of the thing and there's what the thing actually is and the relationship is basically arbitrary. It isn't 100% arbitrary, but it's basically arbitrary, right? Um, like the fact of whether or not it came from Wuhan is independent of what you called it. Like you could have called it the Colorado virus and it could have still come from Wuhan, right? But for people that don't have this sort of like, and this is like a really base level of philosophical uh, sophistication, it's very easy to be like, oh my God, like it's right in the name. Like, how could I not have seen it, right? And I just think this happens all the time, like all the time, especially uh, with political terms. So at some point, um, useful idiot was astroturfed. And the way you can see it was astroturfed is you basically go on Google Trends and there's huge spikes. So it's like, no one is ever using that term and suddenly everyone is using it. Um, and it's just, you see other people using it, you then, you know, because the way that our society is currently designed, start using the term, which then gives it legitimacy. And then it's just a weapon to be used against enemies, where if they would say, oh, these are the enemies, think bad things of them and, you know, tweet bad things about them, you wouldn't do it. But if all of your friends are using this concept and this concept very easily leads to some ideas, then you'll just have them. Um, so, you know, for example, when Trump called, uh, the virus, the China virus, right? Like he was trying to do that. Like it's a virus that came from China and China is at fault. Like there's a whole constellation of ideas that come bound just in the name of it. Um, and then I'm claiming that this is a type of thing and that it happens all over the fucking place. And even people that, you know, we would probably think of, you know, as good people with like ultimately good intentions and so on are definitely smart enough if they are creating new names, if they are creating new concepts, if they are creating new ideas, they are definitely smart enough to think about why they should name something one way 
or another and what kind of um, ideas that will lead to. Um, here's, here's another example. Here's the toy example. You can imagine generating um, a psychological theory that says that everything that people do is because they have some ultimate aim, right? Like super simple toy model. And then you could call the ultimate aim good aims. And that makes it really hard to ask the question, well, can someone's good aim be bad, right? It, it sounds like a contradiction. It isn't a contradiction because like good aim is just what like what you're calling that thing. And then logically it could be bad, but it just makes it hard. And then, you know, people who are coming up with you know, novel theories, novel concepts, novel ideas, 100% uh, are thinking about this. Um, and so, yeah, and so as, you know, again, because of the community, I feel like I need to develop my thoughts to a level of sophistication where I basically won't be owned by this or eaten by these um, ideologically, uh, ideology-like um, attacks, sort of, I guess you could call them. Um, just because I have been eaten in the past a bunch and it's not pleasant and I don't recommend it. Um, contrary to focusing, which I definitely do recommend. Um, and so that's the reason. Hmm. Do you, um, from that perspective, do you read other, what other people write or do you mostly just create your own stuff? Um, I read fairly little. Um, I mm -hmm. spent a few years reading a bunch um, and at this point, it just feels like on the margin, my time is like way better spent um, just creating my own stuff and having my own insight. Like I can just trigger my own insights so I don't have the necessity of getting them from the outside. And, you know, you know there's exceptions. I think there are interesting people um, who will have, you know, interesting angles or an interesting stance on life or like an interesting phenomenology that I want to eat. Um, Sorry, that's a weird way of saying it. But anyways, an attitude towards life that I would like to replicate in myself. Um, and I will engage with those. But definitely the bulk is on generating my own stuff. You said earlier that uh, you, one thing that you like about Twitter is that, you know, as opposed to the guy that you worked with in Slovenia, is that there's like thousands of people interacting with what you write. Like, yeah. how does that connect to this dimension of uh being wary of people importing various memes or agendas that uh you might not be wanting to endorse yeah um so there's you know two ways that that can go one is um i'm exporting those bad memes into other people um mm -hmm. the other one is i'm importing it from them so as to the exportation um i'm not super worried about that because I think I would have to be like fairly deliberate to craft it. Like, I don't think it would happen by accident. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to do it, uh, you know, can take my word for it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that arena is fine. And then on importing it to other people, um, I think it would be fairly hard for me to get it from tweets because mm -hmm. it's just too small it's like I, it's like you know it's fucking two sentences basically i can immediately analyze what's going on there um i think the sort of value that i usually get is people being like oh maybe this thing is that thing oh so it's more like i treat what people say as like suggestions or hypothesis um that i then do my own you know analysis or judgment on um and and you know and i think <laughs> I think almost, I think very few people are this kind of like high level players uh, that I'm speaking of that I'm like particularly cautious about. So like I'd, I'd be, you know, much more wary of, you know, whomever, uh, you know, leading intellectual that has, you know, 500,000 Twitter followers and goes on all of the podcasts and all of that. And then like, if that guy is producing novel content and novel carnages, I'd be like, super curious to know what his actual agenda is yeah so, so I'm, I'm not i'm not super worried about, about like people at our level so to speak mm -hmm. i'm getting this image from that of like the, the the exporting importing distinction of like you having like essentially like an intellectual psychological firewall where you're like uh, guarding what goes out and what comes in does that seem fair yeah 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 i think a firewall is a great way of subscribing it so talk to me a little bit more about the exporting then. Um, like I find myself, uh, I haven't really taken the time to thoroughly articulate this other than uh, attending a lot to the Buddhist concept of right speech. But mm -hmm. 
I, I have a pretty built up nuanced heuristics around uh, ethics of speech online. And I'd be curious to sort of compare notes with you about like how, how you attend to what you do and do not say. And if there are any like rules that you have for yourself about what you put out there and things like that. Yeah. Um, I don't have any super strict rules. I maybe don't even have any explicit rules. Um, mm -hmm. I think in general, the intention between what I'm saying, especially when I generalize it, um, is for people to find in their experience the thing that I'm trying to point to because it has helped me. So it's like the thought of or treat as a byproduct of a specific um, you know, experience or update um, is something that I, when I tweet in part, I'm hoping will lead people down the same garden path that leads the same way. Um, and in general, because it feels like, you know, my experience is getting better. I'm frightfully less insane. <laughs> you know, in general, I, 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 I feel pretty good. Um, I think objectively my life is like good on a bunch of dimensions. I'm not like super concerned about that causing like um, unexpected damage on people. Like I'd be kind of shocked if I got to DM of someone being like, yo, just so you know, like I got super depressed because of this tweet of yours and I broke up with my girlfriend, it was a huge mistake and I hate you. Like that would be <laughs> like maybe, but I would be shocked and I've gotten a bunch of, and you know, of course it might be a selection effect, but I've gotten a bunch of people DMing like, but, and, and by a bunch, I mean like, like really quite a few DMing stuff like, yo, this tweet was great or like, thanks for the spirit or like, this is really inspiring or like, blah, 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 like this is great. Um, so it seems like it's having a positive effect on people in general. Um, and also, I, I guess I a little bit trust people to self-select. So it's like, you know, if my tweets make you feel bad, like and follow, like, that's super. Totally, legit. totally. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that makes you, um, you uncomfortable to talk about just for yourself? Like that you, if you start tweeting in that direction, you're like, oh no, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> um, yeah, probably intimate relationships like romantic and sex and in part because a few people like know who the rival account corresponds to IRL and in part because of having been brought in brought up in a very catholic country in a very catholic family and that's kind of like um you know I was <laughs> this is going to sound so quaint but I was once in America and two girls one of them was saying, oh yeah, I'm a sapiosexual. And then the other one was like, yeah, me too. And I was like, what the fuck? Like people discussing their sexuality in public was like, <laughs> you know, super weird, super out there. Not an experience I was familiar with at all. Um, so yeah, so I think about that, maybe I wouldn't post so much. Although that, feels like maybe it's shifting like that whole area feels less twisted less constrained um more 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 natural more safe um i think i think that's the one and, and like you know the whole thing about god probably just because i'm so uncertain about like what the fuck is going on there um but yeah other than that and then you know you know there's things okay i don't want to say these things okay there's things that if I said would get me banned, but for almost all of those things, I also don't want to say them, right? Like, I don't want to say I want to genocide, whatever, um, population. Um, so yeah, so there's also things I wouldn't say just because I, <laughs> they're not true and I don't care for them. Um, how do these uh, gray areas, shall we call them, that are you know, uncomfortable to talk about, or you might be wary of talking about, how do those interact with this process that you have that we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, they're probably going to get eaten over time. And I will also mm -hmm. be talking about them. That's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I've experienced it myself as like, having a mental checklist of things that I'm uncomfortable talking about. And yeah. like, it's like, my intention is to work my way up to being comfortable talking about all of them yeah yeah so that's what i like um expect to happen so for example 
one example of that kind of sort of maybe is that I started Rival as this like, you know, you know, basically anonymous character. And then I met people IRL who only knew me as Rival. And that already was like, you know, I was kind of showing these people my deepest, darkest thoughts. Um, and there has been somewhat of a progression in that direction. Like I think maybe today I would feel comfortable swapping um, the name for my real name and the picture for my real picture. So like I would be comfortable associating all of that that I've said to me, uh, like IRL me. And I just expect that over time, there's something weird going on with like things you're uncomfortable talking about. It's like your relationship to them is incorrect in some way. Um, I'm articulating this right now, so I, I don't really know what I'm speaking about, but um, it feels like none of those things are like out of this world somehow, like they're all here and they're all real and they're all real for you at least. Um, and you know, there might be insane in all sorts of ways in part because you haven't brought them to light, um, you know, but even insanity is like of this world and yeah, and of this world. Um, and so I just, I just expect that the process is like chewing through everything, so to speak, and it will eventually just like chew through that. Like, you know, horny posting rival might happen. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's been a very fruitful area for me to explore. Um, yeah. uh, what's it been like for you when you've met people that only know you as rival and you've met them in, in person? Man, fucking first time was really trippy uh, because it was actually a call and mm. I would feel myself shifting between like rival personality and like me. Um, so that was bizarre for me and for mm. the other person. That, that mm. was like just really, really weird. Um, over time, I think that, you know, everything has become more integrated and there has been a bunch of uh, Twitter people who have moved to Lisbon, um, you know, in, in part because I hyperstition that they claim. Mm -hmm. And um, I met them and it was like a house party. Um, I don't know how many people it was, like eight or something or 10. And yeah, it was really fine. Um, it was like shockingly fine. They were like, yeah, you're a rival. Like we love the shit that you say. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Totally. Get out of here. Because like, I guess I was raised on a social environment that led to the expectation that all of those things would not, yeah, would not, yeah, socially would, yeah, would not, yeah, sit well with people. Um, and then they did. And everyone was like, yeah, no, sure. Yeah, it, it was, it was, the thing was, it wasn't a big deal, like, at all. They were just like, yeah, you're just the guy that says those things. And we're other people who say other things. And it's all good. Um, and so it actually felt, like, really, really good. Um, it was very nice to get that social acceptance from the outside for like things that I really thought I was gonna get rejected for and to have uh, my expectations uh, broken in such a positive way such that then I could interject with myself. Uh, I, I could not be relating harder right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, you look like you're relating very hard. Yes, uh, it's so healing. I mean, just the, the thing that you expected was going to be what you'd be crucified for is actually the thing that people love you the most deeply for. Yeah, it's so strange. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like your fucking expectations are 180 degrees away from the truth. It's like, it's exactly, it's like the thing you most fear to put out there is precisely what people most love you for. It's like, what? That's what? So strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so tell me, I want to just, you know, earlier we, we um, zoomed out and, and you did a brief intro on focusing. Could you do the yeah. same thing for, about hyperstition for anyone that might not know what that is? Oh, yeah. 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 It's basically memeing something into existence. Um, that's, that's the way I was describing. I think there's like, um, you know, a, a more formal slash serious introduction that says that it's probably a concept either from Nick Land, uh, which is this you know, very interesting guy who was a professor in the UK, I think, and then uh, got burned down on mass and moved to Shanghai um, and had like all sorts of very interesting ideas. Um, and, you know, and then he would kind of go deep and say how it, would, it was part of his research group. The way that people use it is basically, I think, memeing something into existence. So it's like, um, you know, 
you keep speaking about it and the, the act of you speaking about it eventually makes it true. Um, so, so I was fantasizing about, um, you know, these sorts of people moving into Lisbon since at least 2018, maybe 2017, started, um, you know, talking a little bit about Lisbon in, um, in, uh, on Twitter. There was also um, people on Facebook who wanted to move somewhere during COVID um, because they didn't want to be in the US. And I was like, you know, have you guys heard about Lisbon? Um, there's also like crypto rich people that I'm like, did you know there's 0% tax on crypto in Lisbon? Uh, <laughs> so I, I've, I've been putting all of this out into the universe and then like the universe kind of made it so that there's um, a Twitter group house that moved here, um, 60 or so, I think mostly American people who also moved here temporarily for a retreat. Um, and, you know, and then other like uh, former less wrong uh, American people also who moved here um, and, and they all kind of like found one another. Uh, and yeah, it's been pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for explaining that. I, I love hearing how you describe that because uh, my, my own experience of it is, is very similar, but I would use different words. So it's mm -hmm. just nice to hear how you would talk about it. Um, yeah. Uh, um, there's, there's a question that I'm wanting to ask you, but it requires a couple of buildup questions. So um, uh, I, I noticed that you've been posting more recently, or, or at least I, maybe they've come into my awareness more, uh, like various feedback loop diagrams. Can you talk about what those are and what you're trying to do there? Um, yeah, it, yeah, super simple. So basically it's just um, when I notice that I have a process going on, I just uh, sketch it out and stare at it uh, because I think getting like the eagle uh, eagle eye view um, of your own process can be like really, really informative in terms of um, situating yourself on what you're doing. So like, I, as I've said, I don't really plan to do stuff mostly. I just like find myself doing it. And I also like kind of like want to know what I'm doing. Um, and then like those sketches really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, the, one of the ones that I really liked um, is the is the vibing feedback loop diagram. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you know, vibing is an interest of mine, and mm -hmm. um, there's this guy called um, Randall Collins, who's a sociologist, wrote a book called Sociology of Philosophy, I think, where he tracks all of the um, basically philosophical groups that existed through history and how they relate to one another. And he has a theory um, where he says that basically if you put a bunch of human bodies together and they have a shared object of attention um, and there's barriers to the outside and, and, and you know there's like a few more constraints, basically um, you go above a threshold such that they're all effectively, he doesn't use this term, but effectively what they're doing is they're vibing with one another. And that's like, he calls it emotional energy, but it's basically the same thing. And basically that ends up producing group solidarity, which is, you know, basically the feeling that you're in a group, you're not an individual anymore, you're part of this group. And it produces uh, symbols, including sacred symbols like the cross, for example. Um, and I think what I posted was a very simple diagram um, of how vibing works um, in his explanation. Um, yeah, and that was basically it. He's, he's, yeah, I think his work is really, really good. And, you know, vibing is a huge interest of mine. I think vibing is a huge interest of like our corner of Twitter because it will select for people who are, um, you know, very bright, but also very much in their heads. Um, and that makes it so that bodily shared attention is difficult, which makes it so that vibing is difficult. And vibing kind of feels a little bit like a basic human necessity because feeling part of a group or feeling part of something that's bigger than yourself kind of feels a little bit like a basic human necessity. Um, and so I thought that maybe that diagram could like, um, you know, illuminate some people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you uh, imagine some people won't have seen it and I can post it in the show notes, but can you verbally describe what you found there? Uh, probably not because I don't remember it. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can pull it up one second. Yeah, you got it. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so I remember there's basically like the, the concepts that I remember were like rhythmic entrainment. 
Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about about that and what that means. Yeah. So basically, it means um, okay. I actually found the the, the diagram. Um, okay. Great. Yeah, so it's rhythmic entrainment, shared mood, and mutual attention. So mutual attention is just the thing we talked about, which is you're attending to the same object, right? This kind of gets fucked a bunch um, nowadays, like, you know, when someone pulls out their phone um, mm. because they're uncomfortable, right? And that breaks, like, that shared attention. Um, mm. So that's one thing. Um, shared mood is basically, you know, you're all in the same mood. Like, if you're going out with people uh, to club and one of the people are it really isn't feeling it um, that's going to make it harder if you're all like in the same mood that's going to make it easier and then both of those kind of like build up on one another um, and build up on this you know rhythmic entrainment which is physically um, your bodies getting synced to one another um, so I think in groups you see this a bunch where you know groups kind of like a little bit move as a unit and people inside of them start like physically in the moment acting more like one another. Um, and I would not at all be surprised if it goes like, you know, you see someone, they're moving in a way, you feel like moving the same way, you're both moving in the same way. This means that you're sort of experiencing the same things now. This seems that your brains are sort of like experiencing the same things now. And like at the level of like, you know, um, frequencies or rhythm and so on. And then it's like, you're literally getting more in the same wavelength in a very uh, literal sense. Um, and then also, of course, in the metaphorical sense where you know you feel like a group, you're feeling the same feelings, you have the same mood, you're attending to the same objects, so you're having a very similar experience. Um, yeah, and that's what it was about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, that's really helpful. Um, going back to what you said earlier about like it's helpful to uh, discern and articulate and maybe even visualize a, a, a process when you become aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've recently become aware of with these interviews is uh, basically I, I've sort of iterated on a specific format that uh, wasn't conscious to me at first but has become conscious mm -hmm. which is like I like to start with talking about someone's story and who they are personally and then um, I ask them like basically as many or ideally all of the like object level questions that I would yeah. like to ask, like interview level style. Um, mm. And that's very directed, right? It's like, I am asking you questions, right? Um, but then uh, I want to open it up into a conversation that's like, we've prepared a meal together and now let's eat it. What, what is possible based on uh, everything that we've discussed, knowing who you are as a person, your story, and then also having all of these like object level content things to engage with. Um, mm -hmm. so I'd kind of like to open up that up now with this question of vibing and like, I'd be curious to ask you what your experience is right now of like this conversation and what this has been like for you and like what it feels like and what's going well for about you or what's, what feels off or anything like that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one of the main things in my experience is that I really need to pee. Uh, yeah, me too, actually. We're in train. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I've been drinking a lot of water uh, during yeah. this interview because my throat was getting dry at some point. Yeah, I, it's, yeah, okay, cool. I hadn't noticed that before, but definitely happens like with this, um, you know, volume of talking like whatever, water and then the pee situation. So that's one thing. Um, then the other is, um, so we hadn't talked before. Um, I liked when you were vibing very hard when uh, with something I was saying. That was really good. Oh, yeah, with the thing about people loving you exactly for the thing you feared being crucified for. It felt very good that you related to that. Um, and it's like the fact feels good. You relating to it by itself feels good. And the fact that you probably relate to it because you had a similar experience also feels great. So like that, mm -hmm. that all was like, you know, just a ball of greatness. Um, mm -hmm. And then other than that, I just feel a little bit um, like I would want to know more about you mm. because you're wearing a funny thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and I think I faintly recall that your head was shaved before, mm -hmm. but now it wasn't and I expect mm -hmm. it to be. And also I think I faintly recall that you were at maybe uh, Maple or Oak would be the name, maybe. 
Yeah. Most of them, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then, and so you then would have some experience uh, with, um, you know, teachers and traditions, I think. Um, and then I personally, and I'm, you know, not caring about the listener at <laughs> one inch at this point, uh, but I personally would be interested in that and not like how that has been. Mm -hmm. so that's like the main things popping up. Yeah, right. Um, well, one thing I'm, I'm aware of is like this conversation is pretty unusual for me and that I really tend to schedule them ahead of time and be prepared and also like mm -hmm. set up logistically. And so um, that's one thing that it's, it's kind of nice. It's like getting out of my comfort zone. It's like, oh yeah, I can have a great conversation and be totally like, we're just doing it right now. <laughs> uh, but um, I, what I propose is, and, and this is just an option, but uh, maybe we could both go to the bathroom and pause for a second and come back and <laughs> pick up these threads since we're entrained in that rhythm as well. How yeah. would that sound to you? Yeah, it sounds great. Let's do it. Okay, and, great. And, uh, you know that the audience can also go to the bathroom if they need to. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. All right, everybody, we'll be right back. Intermission. <laughs> <laughs> Ready when you are, friend. Hi. Um, one thing that came to me that seems like worth mentioning is you talked about how it felt really enjoyable that I was relating to what you're saying. And my experience of that was like, I was, uh, to an unusual degree revealing or emoting the fact that I was relating, but that like the whole conversation was very much relating. I was just like, it was like exploding how huh. much I was really, I was like, oh, I can't, I can't hold back that I'm really <laughs> relating to this right now. But the rest of it was like very much the same vibe of like, yes, yes, like this is what I've been doing. And, and, and also like the fact that there are this many questions that are available to me to ask is like, I experience at least of like, oh, I've been really vibing with your stuff for a long time. Even just knowing that you exist and you're doing the thing that you're doing, like is me vibing with you. And so the, it, what was unusual for me in that moment was the emoting, the emoting of it and the revealing of it and expressing of it. Got it. Yeah, that's okay. So, <clears throat> so full disclosure, because we're now in the full disclosure part of the conversation. Yeah. Also, part was going to be lame because I was like, yeah, we're going to talk about random stuff, whatever, but actually it's amazing. And here's why. <laughs> Uh, you thought what was going to be lame? Like, like this, this part where it's just like an open, like, yeah. you know, looking back and like analyzing, like when the YouTubers analyze their old videos or whatever. But this is actually uh -huh. super interesting now to me because um, I'm curious. Okay. So, so for two, two reasons, actually. One is I, I, I think it kind of slipped my mind that you didn't prepare. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you were able to ask as many questions as you did without preparation makes me feel really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I 
because it's like because it, because you know a little bit like you know you throw content into the abyss and then like sometimes it shouts back but you don't really know if it's landing with people like th like there's no good measurement of how much it's affecting people and i do you know insofar as it's good to want to affect people so that felt amazing so thank you for that now that i realize that that's really really good um mm -hmm. so that's one part and then the second part is um i wish that i um uh, had seen more how you were relating to the stuff that I was saying before. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, as I said, like, I'm kind of like, you know, making this shit up as I go. And then the fact that someone else is on a parallel path and being like, yeah, no, this, <laughs> I totally understand what you're talking about. Uh, that feels really, really good. And I wish that you hadn't only been enabled to emote at that moment, but that you had been enabled to emote the whole conversation. And like the whole time I'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. I think it's I, I think it's a, a growth edge for me, frankly. It's something I've been stepping into more and more with each of these conversations. Um, uh -huh. I, I think I experience it as like um, just noticing my curiosity and asking the question and listening attentively to someone is like uh, extre extremely resource intensive. And so like emoting feels like a whole other layer of complexity that I'm I don't necessarily want to uh show or like spend energy on in, in especially the interview section because sure. it's like i want to be like tunneling a path but but i think i could i don't think it like is intrinsically resource expensive it's just for me and my nervous system it's like hard to do both got it got it no yeah so that makes sense and after having said that like i'm a little bit happy maybe because mm -hmm. um i have very few energy sinks so if <laughs> i'm with someone who will just like mirror like we can get into like this loop um and then it would be very fun for us but i don't know how good of an interview we do have. yeah <laughs> yeah i think it'd be fun i don't know i've been thinking about um i saw this video you posted of a comedian interviewing someone and the, and the woman and the guy are like moving their bodies at the same time yeah. and like yeah, yeah, yeah. making jokes together at the same time i so i suspect it would be very fun for people if i was like at a higher level able to do that okay that would actually be fun okay so so uh, you know, I don't want to set any standard for you, anything like that. But mm -hmm. but um, if I do eventually do a face reveal and mm -hmm. you feel comfortable, you know, far into the future, um, I would be ecstatic to do a two hours vibing the tribal voices session where we just vibe for fucking two hours and that's it. That's the content. Is that vibe? Uh, you know, I'm down. The only thing is like scheduling because it's much easier for me to actually schedule stuff. But I'm, I, you yeah, know, yeah. if, like, yeah. if the time I will and opportunity, I'm totally down. I will down. schedule for that. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will, I will compromise on the scheduling. <laughs> Wait, what? So what changed there? Like, what, what are, what are your boundaries or needs around scheduling versus not scheduling, and what makes you now want to schedule that kind of thing? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's just like, in general, I like to have free time unless I know that the thing is going to be like way better than <laughs> anything that could possibly come. And uh -huh. two hours vibing session sounds way better than anything that could possibly come. Enough that I'm like, yeah, fuck it, I'll just do it. Um, and because it's like, and because it's nice in the sense that um, it represents like um, um, some sort of like, growth milestone or something for you um mm. and then, like 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 i feel like a little bit you know and maybe this is not my place whatever but fuck it this is what i feel um that i'm giving you like an aim so it's like you already felt like this is a growth thing and then you kind of like get your your prize at the end uh, you know and of course there's going to be very many prizes it's not just that but i think that's i don't know it just sounds like a fucking exciting idea <laughs> yeah so so part of me is like this is so sweet and it's like a, on the one hand a huge compliment to me and also like a gift that you're offering me and i feel like very tender and sweet and almost like like brotherly energy from you and that's really nice uh and then another part is like oh god like uh, this is a growth edge for me like what if i what if we were, we schedule this thing and it's just like i can't vibe at all and like oh no <laughs> that's you know? also be hilarious <laughs> that would be hilarious all right done yeah. <laughs> done yeah the awkward is the strength here yeah, yeah yeah i think i think it's a no lose situation it's yeah uh, no lose situation i love it i love it huh 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 yeah huh um so so you were you were sort of um alluding to wanting to ask me questions and uh things about you know in my hair and monastic training and all that <laughs> does that still feel alive to you 
Yeah, I want to ask questions about your hair. Um, <laughs> sorry, no. I mean, I can. Um, but if, I mean, insofar as it has a meaning, uh, I, I care about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually interested about the, like maple slash oak slash, you know, whatever brought you there. Um, mm -hmm. Slash, you know, how was it to have a teacher? Because I think you have a teacher there. Or a guru? I don't know what you call him. Uh, meditation master? Yeah, I don't even know what the term teacher, is. Teacher, I called him my teacher, yeah. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious, you know, what led you, and you know, if you've talked about this a million times in other interviews, I'm glad to have it just like as a personal conversation and not in the, but up to you. Oh, no, this is all, uh, this is all conversation now. So um, okay. I'm totally down. Um, yeah, I mean, I started meditating like a decade ago at this point, and the first few years were on my own, but it was just mm -hmm. miserable. It was like excruciating. Uh, <laughs> I was, um, you know, basically following my breath or doing body scans on my own for half an hour a day. And it felt like, like the metaphor that always comes to mind for me. And, and this is just how it is for me, uh, you know, but it's like flossing of like, oh, I should do this thing. It's good for me, but I don't necessarily like it. It's not my favorite thing in the world. I'll do it anyway. But, uh, right. Um, you did it for three years. Yeah, something like three years uh, on my own every day. And, um, you yeah, know, it, it had, Holy yeah. Shit. Okay, that's crazy. Okay, that's well, okay. You have I mean, mostly, I, I'm sure I had, you know, streaks and so on, but it was like pretty much every day for three years or so. Yeah. Um, and, but I was very serious about it. I knew that I wanted to go deeper and um, uh, started for, for a variety of reasons, started seriously considering monasteries as the place to go deeper. And so, um, but I, but there weren't, hmm. I've never put it this way, but when I looked around at the different monasteries that I could train at, I wasn't vibing with any of them. I was like, I'm not going to fit in here. They're not going to be able to work with me as like a contemporary millennial American from suburban America. Like, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I heard about what's now called the Monastic Academy and that they were using Shenzhen stuff. And I was like, okay, I could go there because I like Shenzhen stuff. I relate to it. It makes sense to me. And they're also, it's in Vermont. They're going to understand me they're going to be able to work with me. And I went there and visited and I loved it. I loved the community. I loved the teacher. So are you. And so, yeah, I decided to train there and um, I trained there in two periods, uh, one for two years. And then I left for about a year and then came back and did almost three years. And um, wow. okay. yeah, so it was, it was a big part of my path. And, um, you know, I decided to leave earlier this year. And uh, so I'm now out as a sort of lay person again, but um, still very much trying to follow my own sense of the spiritual path and honor the different lessons that I learned there, I'd say. Got it. And then, so you were there for five years and then you have Twitter access during those five years. I've had Twitter since like 2007, maybe 2008. Um, and yeah, I was tweeting during the whole time. Could you go on, on Twitter? Say again? When you were at the monastery, could you go on Twitter? Not on say retreats. Uh, I mean, no. I would be off basically, um, I have this tweet somewhere that's like, I'm either extremely online or extremely offline and I like it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I would go on retreat once a month or in some cases, much longer retreats, two weeks. I was in a cabin last year for a hundred days and then 17 days um, where I wasn't online. But if I, but if I wasn't on retreat, yeah, I was online and I, I would often spend most of my free time online tweeting or writing or work, working on blog posts and things like that. Got it, got it. Why yeah. did you decide to leave? Mm. Um, that's complicated and confusing. It took me, a, it was a long process of like six, eight months of deciding, going back and forth about it. I think um, the, the simplest explanation I can think of at this time that's like feels most true is that my mind thought that I should stay there and my body thought that I should leave or felt, felt that I should leave. And uh, there was kind of a war between my mind being like, this is the best thing you could do. And this is what you should do with your life. And this is an inc incredibly important project and you should awaken and all of these things. And then my body feeling like this is not the place and the time to do this. Uh, and um, yeah, since then, my, since I, I sort of decided to trust my body and mm -hmm. go with that. And since leaving there's been a tremendous shift in how my body feels um, orienting in the world. And then I also feel very validated by seeing the ways that I'm spending my time and energy, you know, like this, this conversation, I, I wouldn't have 
anticipated this conversation. I, I couldn't possibly have had this conversation if I was still in monastic training in, in quite the same way that we're having it now. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly true for all of the endeavors that I'm doing right now. And uh, I see myself growing and changing from the things that I'm doing. And I also see others benefiting from the ways that I'm spending my time and energy. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a hard fork to the left that I didn't expect, but mm -hmm. it seems to be going well for me. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Sweet. That sounds good. Okay. Did your experience, because you had three years uh, basically on your own and then uh, with a teacher, was it very different? Mm. I'm not sure I understand. What, like I was working I, with my teacher the whole time that I was there. Oh, sorry. Sorry. But before you joined the... Oh, I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. Totally different. Totally different. Um, uh, I mean, the metaphor that often comes to mind for this is like, I was someone that uh, like jogged twice a week. And then I joined like, I don't know, like a varsity college track team or something. And mm -hmm. it's like, it's just totally different, um, like a hi much higher rigor. There's like someone that's there to help you and support you in the thing you're doing. There's other people that are doing it as well that you can talk to that understand why you care. It's just like uh, higher level of professionalism and excellence and you know, you get better at the thing. So, you know, I, I mean, I think I was basically f emotionally and to some extent physically abusing myself in my meditation practice. I mean, abusing might be too intense of a way to phrase it. It wasn't like, you know, extremely damaging or harmful, but like mm -hmm. if abusing is like an eight in intensity, let's say like a three or a four. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just was much more supported having a teacher and a community and actual techniques and suggestions to do uh, that, that made it a much uh, psychologically healthier prospect and also made real shifts and transformations start to happen. Got it, got it, okay. And I mean, I was like doing good stuff on my own. It was, it was fine, but it was just slower and harder and more painful and not as beneficial. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, okay. And so this time you left because of this like, um, you know, mind, body, tug of war. And then the last time that you left, why did you leave? Hmm. I started dating someone and I felt like, I, well, I wanted to explore that connection. And so I moved in with her and um, also it felt like I couldn't in integrity, both do the training and be in that relationship. And so I decided to explore the relationship for a time. Got it. Does the training end? So like, if you get away from, are they like, okay, good. Now you go on and do your life. <laughs> No, very, very much the opposite. Um, uh, the intention there in that community is that you'll use your awakening to benefit the world and very possibly be a teacher that trains others and has your own place. Um, I was actually put on the sort of teacher track in the last year or so that I was training there. I qualified to teach in that tradition, which is, it's not a requirement to be awakened to be a teacher in that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit in the weeds to talk about it, what the yeah. requirement actually is, but so I'm, I'm not awakened, <laughs> uh, but I was, I was teaching people. I was helping students. I was working with people and, um, you know, I found that enjoyable and people seem to benefit from working with me. And so in some ways I've, um, since leaving still taken that up where I'm, I, I, I find myself teaching meditation. I'm teaching a lot of loving kindness meditation in particular, but also other things. But I, I also, uh, how to put it, I like really don't want to be a teacher and I really don't want to have students. So I, I think of it more as like a guide or a coach that I'm, a uh, capacity that I'm holding. Got it, got it, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. How much of, so you said that um, it was like going from jogging to this track team. How much of that do you think was like, you know, um, the whole, insofar as you can dissociate to how much of that was just like having a teacher versus you know being in that place with that community living there probably i guess etc um well you know i think about it in terms of uh the three treasures from buddhism of mm -hmm. like uh you know there's the buddha the dharma and the sangha and yeah. you know you take refuge in those and and i think that's extremely valuable to do on a like symbolic mythological level um mm -hmm. but i think it's also an extremely practical instruction which is like you should have a teacher 
you should have teachings or techniques that you're following and you should have a community. And if you have each of those three things in place as like necessary components, then good things will happen. Um, mm. I don't know that they're strictly necessary. In, in fact, they can't be strictly necessary, but uh, it's more like if you have the three of them, then that guarantees that things will shift. Uh, yeah. Things could still shift without those being in place, but uh, if you have those three in place, then things will definitely happen. So I had a teacher, I had specific tech techniques that I was doing and teachings that I was following. And I had a community of the other people that were working with the same teacher and were working with similar techniques and teachings. And that is just like rocket fuel spiritually. So uh, was it one or the other? Hard to say. I mean, if I, if I had to choose, I'd say the community is even more valuable than the teacher as as incredible as my teacher Sorry was like, he, he's amazing. He's one of the most incredible humans I've ever met. Certainly complex, um, you know, not, not I, the first few years that I worked with him, I had sort of this unconscious, like he's perfect. I'm terrible dynamic going on. And then that, mm -hmm. that fade away, he, he's not perfect. I'm not terrible. Um, but, uh, but he is an incredible human, incredible person, incredible teacher. And so, but even despite that, if I had to choose, I'd probably say community. And, and I, I imagine he would say so as well. I mean, he, he has, his teacher was quite possibly the best living Zen master, Shodohara Adoroshi. Um, and I think he would, if I had to guess, he would probably say the same thing that at the end of the day, like Sangha, community, other people that are training are like where the rubber really, really, really hits the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might have shifted my views a little bit. <laughs> Tell me about that. What's what's bubbling for you there? Um, so the thing is, in Portugal, it's complicated because we don't even have retreats. Like, you have to go to Spain if you want to do a fucking 10-day retreat. Like, you have to take a plane, basically, if you want to do a 10-day retreat. Um, but I, I would be curious about that because the only one that I did, the three-day one, um, I was really upset um when we started having like basically q a at the end of the third day instead of like just doing more <laughs> because it just felt good and insofar as i could ascertain um you know mental content had stopped bubbling like i didn't have verbal thoughts in my head at least uh, like i was just like with the thing um and i wished it had been longer and i haven't i have been like you know obviously i'm flirting with this whole area um, of like, you know, teachers and community and like proper, you know, doing it properly, going for a retreat somewhere for a few days or weeks. Um, so yeah, so hearing about your experience is interesting from that point of view, especially like the, the metaphors are useful. Yeah, I mean, I would qualify it of like, uh, part of it is, I, I was acutely aware at that point when I first entered training and then the months preceding it that like for me and my character and who I am, I was not going to make progress on the path or sufficiently fast or deep progress mm -hmm. if, if I was doing it on my own. Yeah. Um, from what I've heard, you're doing something that's happening for you that's extremely productive and valuable for you on your own. That said, like I, I'm pretty bullish at this point, especially for folks that are having like deep transformative shifts of like, I would get that sort of checked out with a lineage teacher that knows what they're doing, um, especially because my sense is there's a lot of psychological and ethical and, and possibly probably energetic dimensions and, and maybe even the karmic dimensions of, of this whole territory that like, this is just my guess, but that there are sort of like blind spots around and someone who's lineaged, qualified, who like has been around for longer than you have, uh, who's worked with someone even more senior than them, like can kind of call you on the different blind spots, whatever they may be. And um, you know, that might be a useful and even interesting, valuable thing for you to do, especially, you know, I'm thinking back now, this, this is probably interesting for you. Like the cornerstone of the training that I received is one-to-one -one interviews, interactions with the teacher where you go in and you're doing your practice and the teacher says something, right? And mm -hmm. um, from that perspective, it's almost like, uh, but it's, it's like vibing, right? Uh, on this like extremely deep level and they're where they are and you are where you are and something happens. And what happens is like incredibly emergent and complex and shifts your consciousness. And 
uh, I, it takes time to learn how to vibe on that level. And I, I had an excruciating time with it, to be honest. Uh, it's like extremely hard, but um, it doesn't need to be that way. It was, it was hard for me. And so to the extent that you are having these kinds of shifts, like I would be very curious to hear what it would be like for you to have those kinds of interactions with someone who's like extremely deep, qualified, has been around for a while, been around the block, like, and can call you on any shit that might be coming up for you of any like blind spots or hidden things that you're not even noticing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely interesting because um, when you talked about the ethical and energetic and karmic uh, dimensions, uh, so, you know, I, I think almost certainly on the ethical, you have more content than I and more views, um, more expertise probably also. And then the energetic and karmic for me will just be pure blind spots basically because I don't mm -hmm. have anything to connect there. Um, so yeah, so I'd be curious about this for sure. Um, and But I do have a question. So about those, um, you know, um, the teacher asking you questions as you're going about your practice, is it like, you know, you sit down, you start practicing and then they interrupt you and they're like, oh, what was that? <laughs> like, how, how does it actually work? Yeah. I mean, there's a whole art to it that uh -huh. took me years to learn that. Well, one, it took me literally years to learn that there even was an art to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and then it took me more years to like work on the art. And I, as I say, I was, it was very hard for me in particular, letting like emotional psychological blocks get in the way of uh, actually doing the thing, mm -hmm. uh, in a, and which is fine. I mean, a good teacher can work with all of that and, and adapt to it and, help you move through that and that's fine that that needs to happen but like that just happened a lot for me and um uh but i think ideally what happens is you as a student are doing your practice all day long every day 24 7 whether you're standing lying down sitting moving whether you're awake whether you're asleep uh, like mm -hmm. you have that rigor of practice you are doing a technique no matter what uh so that that's that's like ideally the the baseline is like you and, and that and that comes from a place of being so internally committed to understanding something or realizing something or achieving something that you are literally willing to make this the number one priority of your life that you would do it 24 7. yeah um an ideal student has that like fire in them where yeah. they are like i have to answer this question or i have to accomplish something or achieve something or understand something and it's probably very different for different people but like you, you have to connect to that fire within of like why you care and use that as fuel to 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 do the technique no matter what okay mm -hmm. and then from that perspective you walk into a room you're already doing the technique it's nothing different right you're just do, it's another moment in a different room where you're doing the technique right mm -hmm. but you walk into a room with an extremely deep being that can interact with you on that level and then they say something or point out something or you know motion or gesture towards something and then you interact and you 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 respond i mean it's it's like what we're doing now except far less verbal and conceptual and more like uh, you know about um how your body feels and how you perceive the world and uh how you interact and move your body and things like this and you're you're vibing on that level on a, a sort of somatic embodied consciousness awareness level and mm -hmm. you're you're dancing and playing there and it's like a like a tennis match of bouncing things back and forth and at, at its peak it feels like like one time can collapse where um you know one minute feels like it was lifetimes of shifts happening for you and then um uh yeah it feels like I, I mean ideally they give you something for you to work on that's like yeah. an assignment it's an assignment and the same way that any other coach would give you like yeah. hey go work on this thing and come back to me when you when you finished it and ideally you could do that every say 12 hours of like you have an interview in the morning six in the morning after you know chanting and then you work on it all day you're doing your technique all day and you've answered it or solved it or made progress by the evening and you have a second interview where you bring that in but then at its peak, it can feel like you're moving through multiple of these assignments in mm -hmm. one single interview where they're like, hey, you could do this and then you do it. And then they're like, hey, you could do this and then you do it. And then they're like, hey, you could do this and then you do it. And it just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you're just, you know, like speeding through tremendous shifts in consciousness in yeah. a very short time frame on the order of seconds or minutes. 
Okay, that's yeah, that's a very enticing pitch for the kind of person that I am. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, the, speed, the speed running consciousness shifts part is really really interesting for sure. Um, I do I want I do want to say like and I've already said this to some extent, but like I was aware that that degree of integrity commitment transformation is possible but like I very rarely or seldomly played at that level I was just aware that it was possible right. um if I were you know I left and came back if I were to do that again I would, would want to be coming back knowing that I was in a position to be like playing the game at that level if that yeah. makes sense yeah that, yeah that definitely makes sense um yeah and I guess I've had a little bit of a question for myself, which is um, because I, I have the cycle, right? Kind of where I'll, I'll meditate every day for like four months or whatever, and then I'll just drop it for eight months. And now it has been a bit longer, maybe quite a bit longer. And I've been very curious about that, why that is. Um, and, you know, part of me was like, oh yeah, you know, I should pick it back up again. Uh, but other part was like, definitely not, let's not do that. And there's a, um, I can share this later. There's a, there's an image that Romeo Stevens, who I like a lot, has shared, which is like, um, you know, basically it's how concentration, insight, and integration relate. Um, and you know, basically the idea that concentration uh, sets up the stage so that you can have insight, insight drudges up material for integration, integration then makes your concentration stronger, blah blah blah. And I've wondered if I'm in just a very um, long integration phase because I, I was tweeting about this earlier right i tweeted something like um i really hope all of the crying is about integrating material and not uh, about annealing my brain into drama um and, and and there just have been like very many processes of like kind of like spontaneous crying um and seemingly grieving um so it does feel like some things are being put to rest um and so because of that i think i haven't picked back up um the practice but around the time that i do i would definitely in, and i don't know if it's possible uh but you know that that checkup that you talked about uh of the dimensions of the practice i would definitely then be very interested in that yeah yeah i think it's it's generally good practice i mean yeah. uh i mean if, if only especially for the ethical dimension because i think uh and I, I'm very bullish on ethics. And, and one way that I'm looking at my own transition right now is um, that I'm focusing primarily on the training of, of ethics and character and moral development uh, rather than say concentration or insight. Um, but it, it's just ethics tend to be underrated in these circles and just having someone be like, oh, they should check that. And you know, from that perspective, if you know, really anyone can serve that function of like a therapist or a coach or any kind of guide that you trust. I mean, I'm, I'm also pretty bullish at this point on um, noticing who you actually resonate with and who you feel drawn towards and feel good around. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might not be like a traditional lineage teacher. Um, that said, I could be aware of uh, like a danger, a failure mode there where like, you feel comfortable around people that don't call you on your shit. Right, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just tough a little bit, I think, because um, it's like, you know, the ethics of, you know, liberalism seem to be something like, you know, if it feels right, go for it or something like that. And it's like, bruh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think that's gonna lead to great results. Um, and once I think, you start looking at that and I and I'm you know pretty sure I'm an obvious compared to you but once you start looking at that I think that at least I have felt like there was a, a you know there just wasn't very much guidance around it's like I have to go read fucking old texts by fucking mm -hmm. Aristotle or whatever talking about the vices or the virtues or I need to look in like Catholic theology um, and then those people seem to be really concerned about it um, and mm -hmm. then because if I remember correctly in what was his name? Uh, Daniel Ingram's the Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. He says in the morality chapter that morality is the first and the last teaching and like the thing that you really should have, um, you know, uh, nailed kind of a little bit, it feels. Um, but then I didn't feel like there was like, you know, a lot of guidance around that. And then Chuladasa also like the whole thing is basically concentration. Um, 
<laughs> that's very funny uh yeah um yeah it reminds me that um maybe part of the reason i uh, maybe i'm just being arrogant here but part of the reason that um i feel comfortable trusting what i'm drawn towards is because i've worked on character and certain yeah. ethical guidelines and to be clear there's still like ethical work to be done a lot of it but like I know that well for one I know and this this comes back to what you're asking about the clothing like I know that I want to give this life to service and to being a benefit to others so there's that and then there's the precepts of like I am not I'm, I'm going to strive with this life not to harm others you know not to steal or take things I'm going to try not to have sexual misconduct I'm going to try not to lie and I'm going to try to you know not have addictive relationships to say substances or other things that are addictive and uh, or harmful or cause heedlessness. Mm -hmm. And those of course are ongoing questions. I like wrestle with the five precepts constantly and then other ethical concerns, but like I've done some groundwork there that that makes it feel like, you know, kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier of like this process of say shit posting as spiritual practice or psychological, you know, work, whatever you want to call it. Um, like from the foundation of having uh, basic guidelines ethically in place like it seems like if i trust if i follow what my body is called towards it's like good for me and good for other people and good things happen and i can trust that and be okay with it and allow it and it's not like i'm just indulging myself or something right but that's because you've either trained your body on wanting the right kind of things or because you've trained your perception to distinguish between you know your body wanting something because it's wholesome versus because the thing is designed to get you addicted to it right hopefully yeah i mean yeah. <laughs> uh, i could have my own blind spots here as well and i probably do but but i, I hope that that's the case yes yeah okay okay that makes sense so Speaking of what the body is drawn to, yes. um, this was a, an impromptu uh, call and it's 4 yeah. p.m. here and I haven't had lunch yet. Um, so Good, you should eat. Yeah, if it's cool with you, we'd uh, drop it here and I, and I would go have lunch. Which is Perfect. What is drawn to. But yeah, yes. This was well, really thank fun. you so much for talking with me, Rival. It's, it's been really delightful and I'll be very curious to hear what people have to say about this conversation as well. So hopefully yeah. that'll be interesting and valuable. But thanks for talking to me and yeah, enjoy your lunch. Yeah, same. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks for expanding your comfort zone. Mm -hmm.